Welcome to Agile Roots 2010. Sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vireo, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and XMission Internet. Agile UX for Developers, or Why Fluff is Stuff, by Anders Ramsey. First of all, so my name is Anders Ramsey. I uh, work as a user space designer at a company called ThoughtWorks. Global IT consultancy has been doing Agile for a long time, and uh, I've been doing Agile for not as long as ThoughtWorks has been doing Agile, but for a few years. And uh, before that, worked more in the traditional domain, uh, traditional approach that I think many of us did. Uh, have worked as a front-end developer, but primarily as a user experience designer. So, but I've been in in sort of worn many different hats, um, and over those years. And particularly when coming to ThoughtWorks, um, you know, what I've discovered as a user experience designer is that um, there's been sort of this, uh, and, I, and I'm not the only one, I think many have seen sort of there's, this, there's sort of this divide between you know, this thing we call UX and this thing we call uh, development. And it's this ongoing push and pull, and there's very much a desire at companies like ThoughtWorks and many other places to um, find that integration between those points. And what I've also seen going at many different conferences, uh, seeing different speakers and so forth, is uh, there's a tendency uh, that the conversation seems to be, um, how can uh, we communicate to user experience designers what Agile is all about? And so that they can understand that and apply that and bring that into their practice. So, um, so there's been sort of this little bit of a one-way street there as far as uh, a tendency toward uh, is it trying kind to of communicate to a user space designer how can you change the way that you are working, which is you know, assumed to be sort of a traditional waterfall approach, how can you change that and integrate that into um, more of a, an agile approach? And what's kind of been missing there is that there's really more to it. I mean, in some ways, that's almost like an agile anti-pattern because uh, you know an agile approach is not about having this one person you know trying to figure out how everybody else, trying to integrate it into the team, and then the rest of the team isn't understanding what this other person is doing, this other role is doing. So, and something that has really come to a head for me, particularly in working at ThoughtWorks, is the need to look at this from another perspective to basically say. Um, what can one do to explain or try to communicate to you know, developers, and not just developers, but also, um, and I, you know, I realized after I, at the title, I realized you know, it's really broader than that. It's really anybody who is in the team who uh, maybe does not really play a user experience designer role, how can one help them understand what that means and why it's valuable, what, why, why it's useful? Um, so one thing I'm just kind of curious before we kind of keep going, I'm curious to see how many people here would you would think of yourself as a, as a developer or would you put yourself under that category? And how many people did not raise their hand? <laughs> and just to get a sense of what, where, where, where would you call yourselves or what would we have your, just to get some, like, you, so what would you? US designer. US designer, okay. And same. same? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so, Obviously, the, 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 the primary focus here is for me to, um, this is not really, the purpose of this, first of all, is not to be, a, I, wouldn't want, I don't want to stand up here and talk for 90 minutes. I want to probably, hopefully, maybe stand up here and talk maybe 10 minutes to, then we want, the purpose of this is for it to be a workshop where you can kind of get a sense of what it means, what a user experience does, and to enable you to then have a better understanding of how that integrates with, with your work. So just as a kind of a quick overview, um, so that's what the intro, I want to kind of present. Um, it's interesting because I want to look at a lot of things that Jeff actually touched on in his talk, but from a somewhat different perspective. So he was looking at it more of this, this process issue, and he had like this slide where he had, um, you know, where you have like, the, the, it was like this, this CD was like at the output, and then he had like this smiley face and with like the outcome. And what he didn't say, but was very clear in my mind, is what we're talking about there is the output being kind of the, the, the delivery of the software versus the outcome is the experience of the software. And 
the understand the ability to understand those relationships, something we want to talk a little bit about. And then obviously the primary focus of this is going to be the workshop. So just really quickly, the workshop, what I want to do is have three different types of activities that I think will sort of encapsulate and give you a sense of um, what a user experience designer does and how it is very different from what you do and yet how it is valuable and it has an impact on what you do. Um, and then I'm hoping that we have some time. Sorry, let's go. I'm hoping we have some time to do kind of a fishbowl discussion uh, or do some similar format because to me, that's going to be one of the most important things here is for you to be able to reflect on that and share, did I learn something new? Did I not? This was everything, no, this was just what I expected or no, this was totally different. Um, so that's very important. So in terms of introducing this a little bit, um, you guys probably can't see this, but you may recognize this book. Um, so this is uh, Craig Lummer's book, Agile Iterative Development, Manager's Guide. And for me, one of the first books that I read on Agile was very much a um, sort of an aha moment uh, in terms of the way that he, I mean, the book's been around for a while, but the way that he really uh, gets to the essence of one what the problem is with the waterfall approach and summarizes very succinctly these very different models of, of Agile. And um, so on the one hand, this book has been a very powerful book in, from that vantage point, but at the same time, I, it's also representative of what I see as sort of the impetus or the seed for wanting to do a workshop like this because it, it uh, conveys a a way of thinking about software development that is what I want to try to tackle with the, with the workshop today. So in this book, um, Craig talks about uh, the need to tackle uh, um, really complex and challenging issues early in, in, the, in, the, in the development process, which is you know, a, a, a sort of a basic practice, practice of Agile. And when doing so, he talks, he has this quote, he says, maybe the client says, I want the web pages to be green and the system to handle 5,000 simultaneous transactions. Green can wait. So, now I remember reading that way, way back, and that didn't really kind of jump out at me uh, as, as it says, oh yeah, kind of nodding my head and saying, oh, that makes sense, I would agree with that. Um, but now having worked, particularly having worked at ThoughtWorks, where it's a very intensive, um, agile approach. Uh, I'm working side by side with developers, and I have a very clear sense of kind of their vantage point toward what we call the software product. And things that actually Jeff mentioned, you know, this idea of the focus is on uh, burn downs and on velocity and on these on delivery and these things. And to me, what the problem with this statement is that. It is measuring software by very much a kind of a developer-centric uh, yardstick. And so basically it's saying that something like this, this clearly is, is a technological challenge. It has a clear technological, you can measure it and say, that's going to be really hard to achieve. Um, this, from the perspective of developer, um, that may take, that's one line of CSS. That's two seconds, right? So clearly that's very simple. And the point that I, what I want to convey with the, the activities that we'll be doing in a little bit is to show that actually green cannot wait. And I don't mean to pick on Craig Larman. This is not about him. This is about a general attitude in um, software development community in general and agile community more specifically because that's the one that I work on and that's the one that I think we're all uh, sort of immersed in. And the reason green can't wait is because the, this somewhat belies the true complexity of what is sort of implicit here in that kind of the surface layer design is this kind of simpler thing that, you know, uh, it's sort of this soft skill. That, you know, uh, we have these hard skills. People, you know, are, are trained engineers or doing software development. That's something that's really complicated. And, and by the way, could you just go and you know, work on the UI? Somebody, who can work on the UI design? Because somebody just kind of sketch on that. We need some UI. And that's sort of this, this thing. But let's just, let's just get that done. And, uh, you know, and I, and I get, yeah, because I need to get back into some really serious work. So I don't have time for that. So what that, what, what's implicit, what's implicit there is, is this. And, the problem there is that is looking at 
the whole softer problem at this one, from one single dimension being the development dimension. And the way that I think is a much more powerful and accurate way of looking at a software product is as if you think of a, a restaurant. So in a restaurant, we have a kind of, in the restaurant world, we talk about, you guys probably don't know if you really see this, but the front of the house being the dining area, can you, see, can you guys see this? Is this? And the back of the house, which is, is the kitchen, right? And when you go to a restaurant, um, so how many, how many people here were at the Squatters restaurant last night? So when you went there, I mean, what, what did you think of the experience at that restaurant? What was your kind of, did you like it? Would this something bother you? Or is it like bad, good? I loved it, um, but the food was good, the food was good, and also smart people. Okay, <laughs> so, so good, but. And like so, you go in and it seemed, it was pretty laid back. Uh -huh. So community over software, huh? What's that? Community over software. So, um, so I think what you're what you're touching on there is something very interesting. Is that the design of this front room, the front of the house, was such that you didn't really think about it. You were able to actually focus on the things that really mattered. But something that you and none of us, because I was there last night either, and what you don't, you never really see when you go to a restaurant, is the kitchen. The kitchen is the engine of the restaurant. If there is no kitchen, there is no restaurant, right? But at the same time, nobody actually sees it. The things that we see are these highly soft, fuzzy, qualitative things. The ambience, the lighting, uh, was, was the, the waitress, the rapport I had with the waiter or the waitress, um, and so forth. So the reason, so why, why, am I, why am I talking about this? So the reason I'm talking about this is that um, Agile focuses on this problem. So Agile focuses on <coughs> delivery. You know, in, in a kitchen, if you think about a kitchen, what are they focused on? They focus on consistency, delivery, quality, uh, basically of delivering the product right up to here, right? And then somebody picks it up and then, and then they present it. It's the presentation. It's the, it's the experience, the little details. And so, I actually, when I was actually at, a, at an event um, a few months ago, and I talked about presenting present this analogy, and uh, so Ward Cunningham was there, and uh, he kind of, I said, you know, so you know, so basically, Agile's focusing on, on fixing, making a great kitchen, and he kind of nodded his head. And he's like, "Yep, Agile is hot food served quickly," and uh, I think he said it a little bit tongue in cheek, but there's a certain amount of truth to that. And I think what's interesting is with Jeff Patton's talk. Um, what I think he was not really, uh, what was implicit there, but I, didn't, I don't think it really came across, is this dimension issue that, yes, process is one part of the problem, but the other part of the problem is that sort of the things that we're focusing on, estimates, velocity, burn down, it kind of sort of stops here, and now what I want to do is kind of introduce you a little bit to, to this world, because the reality is, in difference from a restaurant, in software, there actually isn't this line. It's just, it's a continuum. It's not like you have this clean little handoff and suddenly, you know, software ends and user experience begins or, or whatever. It's, it's a continuum and that's why it's important for the people who are focused on solving these problems to have an understanding and not necessarily become user experience designers. These are clearly, this is a clearly a different type of thinking that's going into this side clearly a different type of thinking that's going in here. This is more utility oriented. This is much more about um, you know, all the kind of fuzzy, fluffy stuff, right? And, but it's still really important. So um, first of all, I just want to say, does that resonate as far as that analogy? Or does somebody, yes, no? Yeah, that does. Yes. In fact, a number of restaurants that I really enjoy going to have the kitchen open. So it has that gradation. Uh -huh. It's very clear where the back of the house is and where the front of the house is, but there is this, this it does fuzz over, it does, there's this spot where it is both and is neither, and it's, it's that spot there, in fact, is where people like to gather, yeah. just like in individual homes, yeah. for exactly the same reason. Great, yes. I, I was just gonna say, I think this analogy really holds up well because the kitchen, um, Chefs do, do a good chef will pay a lot of attention to presentation mm -hmm. of the actual dish. And so in that way, 
even though you don't see him, you don't see anything, he's, you know, you don't, you don't see the kitchen, you definitely do see what he's created, and, and in that way he does reach out into the front Absolutely. end. Absolutely. You know, so it's not, I mean, if he just slops it on the plate, like, right. there, you know, that wouldn't be a great experience for yes. the user, right? So, so it, it, it takes some thinking on his part to say, you know, I'm going to send something out that's, that's going to be a good experience. But isn't also the, I guess how I see it is, I can do everything great on the back end mm -hmm. um, as a developer. Mm -hmm. I can do everything great, but if I don't have the, if the user experience part sucks, nobody's going to right. experience what you, I'm doing you can have as a developer. An amazing kitchen. Right? If you walk into a restaurant and kind of the music is a little weird or something, it just is it something is off. Then, and I've actually ha I've recently had an experience like that where it, it was that the food was impeccable, and I had a strange experience with some bad service, and I'll, n I'll never go back there. Yes? One thing that is interesting about this analogy, though, is that the chef or the professional, you know, the, the artisan, so to speak, he's in charge of the back end. Mm -hmm. he, he makes a run, it, he does it the way he wants it, it all works the way he wants. The front end is all managed by the business people. Mm -hmm. And so they bring in some interior designer and design it, and they, you know, they hire the waste staff, and they hire the the, the mayor D and they hire all of these people and they, and they run it and the only thing that they really have to do with the back end is telling the chef whether or not their food's good. So that's really interesting. So, I, I, And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want us to get started with the workshop. But it, it does remind us something that I wasn't sure if I was going to raise, but um, when I was talking to Desiree about it, I can't remember the name of this guy. So there's a gentleman by the name of Danny Meyer. And he is um, a top restaurateur in New York City. And he has opened... He's done something that very few restaurateurs ever are able to accomplish. He has opened, uh, I think, six or seven restaurants, and none of them have ever closed. Uh, in most cases, you open a restaurant, they close, and things don't work out, and so forth. And he has something that he calls the hospitality principle. Um, so the hospitality principle is basically the idea that everybody in the restaurant, it doesn't matter what you do, if you're doing dishes, you're a busboy, it doesn't matter, you all understand kind of what so his focus is on the front of the house, but in terms of understanding what everybody else does and having the sense that every, what everybody does actually ha has an impact and you can't just sort of have this functioning isolation. So I would say, in my opinion, that to me, if somebody were to approach design a restaurant like that, I don't think that would be a recipe for success. And now, now I'm sure there are a lot of restaurants where they do approach like that, and I think that may, may be a reason why they close, because there is that separation. So. Um, any other thoughts on that, or yes? Just from the, the UX side of the conversation, it seems to me that your servers are going back into the kitchen. Yes. They are helping to move things forward. Mm -hmm. They're helping to give the client, the patron, part of that experience. And if the process from getting an order sent back, getting the food brought forward, mm -hmm. doesn't work well, then you're left with that empty experience. It doesn't matter what the quality is, the fact that so it does take someone that's in the front of the house being able to move into the back of the house mm -hmm. to facilitate that transaction, to create a dialogue between those two worlds mm -hmm. so that your end user ultimately does enjoy the experience yeah. and want to come back. Right. So it isn't just that one way. Things don't just Absolutely. come Absolutely. There's, there's a back and forth. There's a continuum. I mean, if you think about it, when I'm sitting here, you know, I'm ordering, placing a menu, ordering from the menu, and that goes in, there's maybe some back and forth. Um, there's this whole idea that you don't want whatever happens, um, you don't want to disconnect between this and this. So for example, if somebody wants some little change that you made to their menu, you don't want the waiter to be the person who's saying, sorry, we can't make that change, when the reality is maybe the people in the kitchen would say, sure, that's no problem, I can make that change. So there, th there's that continuity. Yes? You know, I, I agree with whoever said this over here, that the method that metaphor really holds up quite nicely. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but, um, well, let me say this. What happened in the evolution of the restaurant business could also be applied to what we're going through in the building of software. Mm. Um, back in New York in, I think, the 20s, um, there was just this incredible frustration between the kitchen staff and the serving staff, and, and they were just, you know, angry at each other and fighting and it was just just meanness that was going on and this individual invented this little turnstile that the uh, waiters would uh, click their tickets on right right and 
was, hence was invented this you know, method to eliminate communication between the kitchen staff and the serving staff. They would, serving staff, you know, they would, they would drag out the order, they would click it up on the thing, they would turn it around, the kitchen staff would pull it off, make the order, and then, and then put it back up on the, the dining table, and then they would take it out to the kitchen staff. Yeah. And it's interesting that that evolution, really, if you think about great restaurants, they don't do it that way. The individual over here who made the comment is exactly how the great restaurants work. The serving staff will actually go way back into yep. the kitchen. There's an interconnection. Yeah, there. they have relationships with the kitchen staff that even off hours, they will do things to socialize and know each other that, like you said, the focus is on creating great hospitality for the right guests. So and I think that's where we're at in an industry, that we're realizing that that the interconnection between these various roles that build software matters. That these Absolutely. relationships matter. So, so, that's, so that's one of the, the goals here is to um, kind of provide somebody who's coming from a developer side to just have a better understanding what a UX designer does, not with the intention necessarily of becoming a user, user designer, but being part of that. You know, it's like Jeff, Jeff Patton was talking about having you know, shared design and shared sketching. One, one thing that I think is very important for me to mention here, though, and which uh, actually came up in my conversation earlier with Desiree, is that that is also a two-way street. User experience designers do also need to understand what developers do. This is not, now, now that is a topic for another, uh, maybe for, that's something that maybe a talk for me to give or a developer to give at an interaction design conference or something, but um, I just want to point that out. This is not just about um, sort of this one way street. So kind of to get started with, uh, with, with the workshop, um, what's that? Oh, uh, Caleb's our designer, one of the developers. Okay. So going back and forth, role playing a little okay. bit. No, no, that's okay, that's okay. So this is a workshop that's based on an actual project uh, that I worked on and that um, really s sort of stuck out in my mind as being very appropriate for this type uh, of an exercise. And um, so but th there are several reasons for that. So let's kind of look at um, what, what this is. So th it's, a, it's this children's charity project that um, ThoughtWorks does, so ThoughtWorks does a lot of pro bono work. And um, so this was a pro bono project that they did for this children's charity that uh, was doing really good work sort of out in the field, but their website was just this tragedy. I mean, it was just, it, and it was very sad. I mean, you know, and, and um, so, and they didn't even realize that, that it was awful because they were doing such good work out in the field that uh, people were donating, even though it was literally like, um, please donate and click here and then, then you have to go through this horrific process of actually being able to make the donation and all these things. So, so we met with them and one of the interesting things was, um, you know, if, if we were to think of what would be kind of the, the project level card that would come out of that first meeting we had would basically make it better. Uh, and so obviously that, uh, we needed a little more information on that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, What's the, it's a start, it's a start, it's a definitely start, right? So, so, um, uh, so but, but the long and short of it was that uh, they understood what the end result was of what they wanted in terms of we need more donations, we need uh, you know, people to, to, to have their, these overarching goals, but in terms of the actual features that they wanted, um, I don't know, whatever features would lead to those goals. And so one of the problems, you know, with an agile method and something, like, you know, uh, with, with, I think, Jeff implicitly implied, actually, in, in the talk earlier, was um, this idea that uh, in, in one of the sort of an agile, one of the goals of agile was to get developers talking to customers, which is hugely important, hugely valuable. But there's this implicit idea there is that, um, the customer will be able to tell you what they want. Tell me what you want and I will build it for you, <laughs> right? So that actually, I, you know, like I have to say in, the, in their defense, um, this was coming from a more of an enterprise vantage point and in the enterprise realm, you can get a little more of that because they're much more task oriented and it, there's, it, it is more likely that you can provide that. When you're more in the consumer realm or getting into something more consumer facing, public facing, it, that tends to get harder and harder. So, um, so the goal here is to, uh, I want to kind of embody some of those challenges in, in these some of these activities. So what we ended up with um, are these cards, and I don't want to call them stories, because they certainly wouldn't satisfy uh, if we were to 
use kind of the, the smart uh, qualifications or whatever of a story. But this is what we kind of ended up with in terms of our high level, let's call them kind of pseudo epics uh, that came out of these meetings, right? So you want to be able to persuade a larger percentage of site litters to make a donation. You want to be able to persuade site visitors to donate a little more than they originally had intended because they firmly believe that a lot of these people that, you know, they, somebody maybe made uh, a $10 donation or $20 donation or whatever, uh, you know, maybe if they would give me a little more encouragement, maybe they would make a $25 donation or a $30 donation. And over, over a large number of people, that would make a huge difference. And they also, uh, based on some research that they had done, and we also kind of uh, corroborate that, uh, they wanted to make visitors feel confident that their donation is going toward their cause. And uh, because what that means is if I'm confident that donation is going toward this cause, then I'm more likely to tell somebody else, hey, you know, this is really a worthy cause. You should also make a donation. So it, it has that, it creates that virtual cycle. So what's really interesting here is that um, there are these words like persuade and you know, make somebody feel confident and or feel, you know, feel confident, these words that you know, you can't really build something off of these cards, right? I mean, I can't implement that. Uh, build, uh, here, hand this to a developer, make visitors feel confident. It's like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, where's the, co I need the confidence algorithm. So, 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 so what you need to do, there's an intermediary step that needs to happen here. Um, because, uh, if I tell the, ask them, well, what would so, uh, well, well, what feature would you like for you to feel confident? So like I don't know, whatever features are required to make them feel confident. So it's this, you go round and round. So this is where kind of a user experience design uh, capability comes into place. And so what I'd like to do, as far as the, the workshop, and, and I'm going to, we're going to be handing out these cards and everything. Did, was there a question? I thought I saw a hand. No. So what I want to do is first. Um, I'd like us to, to pair up, we're going to do that in a minute, don't, don't get up right now. Then we're going to be doing kind of a, uh, and I'll talk through each of these, uh, what I call the role playing or card storm exercise. I'm going to be time boxing these, and then we're going to be iterating on them, doing a check in to see uh, how we're doing. Um, I want to do something that Jeff again alluded to a design studio. Um, I'll be introducing it. Why? Remember, why um, you guys are doing this? The expectation is not that you guys would somehow be able to do this stuff. I'll be walking around. Uh, answering questions. The purpose is for you to just to kind of get a feel for this, uh, and then we'll be able to discuss it. So it's not expected that you're suddenly going to be, uh, for example, you know, mastering the, the, kind of the design studio uh, activity. And then I'm hoping there's going to be some time for some storytelling. Not uh, possibly, I think there are too many of us to do it for, uh, uh, you know, to the whole group. But in terms of the purpose of storytelling being, once you have come up with a set of cards, once you have used those cards to come up with some idea for a user flow, for you to present that to another pair, and then that pair to listen and say, does, did that, th does that sound persuasive or not? Uh, because that's also one key part of being able to kind of sell the idea, present, present the idea. So, um, so there are quite a few of us here, but I think, and I don't actually know if we're gonna be able to have enough, so this is kind of a little logistical issue, uh, in terms of having enough, um, I think what we're going to do is I think we're going to work in we work in threes. I think that that should that should possibly be we might be able to get a number that's going to be reasonably worth it. Yes, that's right. So I think that's too many. Okay. Yeah. So one of the reasons we pair up. Uh, so this is actually an example of how we're applying uh, how taking you know the user experience practices applying um, more of an agile approach in user experience design, I rarely ever work individually doing user experience design. I'm almost always pairing with somebody. Um, and it's just for all the same reasons that developers pair. Um, so, so what I'd like to do is if we could just take a minute or two and find somebody to pair up with. It would be great if you pair with somebody, one, that is somebody that you don't know, and two, somebody who does not have the, the set of the same skills that you do. But that's that. The, the second of those is less important. It's more mm -hmm. important that you just pair with somebody that you don't know. So if you just take a minute. What we're doing here is a little bit of sort of a uh, a surrogate for kind of doing user interviews uh, and the practice of use, doing a user interview or meeting with the user to to get them to 
to understand what are uh, kind of the, to, to develop cards or doing kind of what we sometimes call card storming. And uh, the purpose of that is to create a foundation for a design studio. Design studio plays a few different roles. One is what's called sort of an ideation clearinghouse. And the purpose of an ideation clearinghouse is whenever you have somebody presents a new product idea to you, or, or we're going to be creating, you know, this new um, the, the new product concept that somebody has described it to you, you tend to see in your mind's eye some kind of idea for how it might work. And it might be a little bit blurry, but you start seeing some various ideas for how it might work. So the purpose of a design studio is first to do what's called passive ideation, where each person just kind of sketches out those ideas that they have in their head. And the second step in a design studio is for you to go around, share those ideas, and then you kind of iterate on those ideas. And you find what was the strongest one, you know, in this case within the pair, and then from that, you take the strongest idea, and then you iterate on that. We may just iterate on it, you know, do one iteration or so, just for you to kind of get a sense of this. And then at the very end, we would have one pair present their idea to another pair. So basically, that is being able to make a persuasive case for your concept. Um, because persuasion is a key aspect of uh, user experience, basically. Um, and sometimes it's highly implicit. It's not like I go to Gmail and I'm persuaded to uh, access my mail. It's more as if there are no obstacles. I feel I can just, I can just do it. And, and so that's more in, in terms of persuasion. In this particular case with the charity site, the persuasion is far more explicit. So here it's about uh, ex really explicitly persuading somebody to make a donation. So let me go back to um, these cards so you kind of have them up in front of you. So what I'd like you to do is in your pair, we're going to take about five minutes, I'd like one person to interview the other person and that person kind of be, be play sort of some role playing here and say, uh, what if you were at this, at a charity site, what would persuade you to make a donation. Or you can also think of what would, what would turn you off to, make, to not make a donation. And the goal of this in five minutes to come up with as many cards for potential features uh, that we're gonna then use for the next exercise. Does that kind of make sense to people? Do they have any questions about that? Yes. Are they only focusing on the first card or are they focusing on the first Well, I'm gonna focus on, on all three. So I'm gonna focus on all three cards um, and uh, you know, basically the goal is, you, it can be somewhat unstructured. That's, that you don't have to stick with any one of these. You can move around. The goal is to put yourself in this situation. Imagine yourself in the situation of, I am now going to be visiting this site. It's for this children's charity um, to help educate, build schools, uh, and, and uh, provide care for uh, children who are in poverty. What would persuade me or what would not persuade me what would you know satisfy these other things? So I'm going to we're going to do, do kind of a five minute time box, and which starts uh, right now. Anybody have some thoughts on, on how this went as far as your experience was with doing this? Yes. Okay. How was it? There's just a lot of tough questions, and you have you need time to think through, and 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 you can't. You're trying to relate to the people that you're trying to help. Your goal at the same time, and there's a lot of questions that kind of pull all together. There, I, guess. I was just going to say that um, often the user, like when you ask the user a question, so what would make you want to do this? The initial reaction is, I don't know. I don't know what would make me want right. to do that. Yes. You know, so they, they don't even know what they want. You know? Exactly. You kind of have to kind of help them discover or maybe just try a few things. I don't know. You have to yeah. somehow coax it out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's a difference between uh, asking a customer what they want versus getting to know what their needs are, you come up with, with how to fill that need and, and that want. Yeah. So uh, if you just ask them, how, how can I pretend you even want more money? That might be the wrong way going about things. <laughs> how, do you value, how do you value the money? Where do you usually, you know, where do you usually go? Well, what, what helps you uh, in your buying the decision to give money to people? And plus, getting to know that background will help you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, specifically on, on getting a larger percentage 
I went back and when I went back to experience that I currently have, what makes it so that I am more willing to, what makes it so, to, what catches me to donate? So I wrote down, I, I had my folks write it specifically, what brings me to donate? And if it's, that can get to ideas where it make it likely for a larger percentage of others to donate as well. Yes. <coughs> uh, after moving through what makes me to donate, I can see more clearly that we can go to customer base and accelerate the who exactly already donated? Uh, what can they do with ten, fifteen dollars exactly? Like what kind of lunch? Picture of lunch. Or, or picture of the school. We need. Or picture of one child with a certain name. We need. Or we need somebody's feedback on that. Who exactly already donated? And are they happy? It's like real examples from real life. Mm -hmm. So, so those are some cards that you produced for the menu. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so, uh, what, one yeah. thing we hit, uh, you know, sort of as uh, a big issue was just convenience. How easy is it to chip in a buck or five bucks, whereas yeah. mostly you have to fill out a bunch of information and just making it through the form will stop a lot of people, whereas if there was some way on the web of chucking in a buck or five, that would be a great enabler of more people to donate. Right. But that's right. a big problem. Yeah. Yes. I feel like with, with even our best ideas, we haven't really tested it. We until we actually put it on the website, we don't know if it's going to work or not. Even if we're really smart and we, you know, think this idea is going to work great. So, right. so this is you know, and that to me is a great way of leading into the integration between um, kind of agile and UX. So one of the big problems with the traditional UX model is time. The ideas may be great, but too, too much time is passing before we really are confronting them with reality. So what we're doing here, I mean, we did a five minute time box, we're doing, we're probably we're gonna do maybe a five plus five plus five design studio. Um, we're talking about, is, you know, so one of the big changes that happens from a traditional approach um, is a change in the units that you use in your work. So a waterfall model, when you're estimating or thinking about your work, I mean, I remember when I worked as a more traditional UI designer, UX designer, someone would ask me, well, how long would this take to do whatever, and I would measure my work in days or weeks, um, while today I'm measuring my work in minutes and hours. So just that is a huge, is a huge shift. So here's a really good point. Yeah. So we, um, we, we were talking about this and the question came up, you know, what do I want? And then Ray asked me, uh, so how would you know, you know, what, what's the what's the measure of success for that? How do you know when you made an impact? <coughs> and my first response was, well, I'm not really sure. There's a million charities out there, but it's up to you guys to tell me what you're doing and make a persuasive argument. Mm -hmm. And we had a couple questions that led up to that, but then he just kind of stared at me, maybe a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> In general, um, and so I, I wanted to use it because it was such a 
the, 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 this particular domain is one that is very much on that level in terms of being persuasive and so forth. But in terms of user experience design in general, it many times it's much more, it's not so much about marketing, it's just about kind of clarity and communication, <coughs> things that you would think of as a soft. Marketing being one instantiation of that. So yeah. Um, so what I want to do, just in the interest of time, um, I want to kind of move on to the next step. And actually, uh, Desiree, if you don't mind uh, helping out with uh, some just volunteering a little bit. So I want to do, if we can, again, I'm not sure how we're going to do with the number of sheets of paper that I have here. But uh, we'll see what it is. So I wanted to kind of, while, while um, basically the goal is basically each pair maybe have like five or so sheets of paper. And while she's handing that out, I don't know, just saying, while they're handing that out, I just wanted to introduce Design Studio a little bit. We talked about it um, just a minute ago, but I wanted to kind of recap and then see if people have questions before we get started. So, um, so again, Design Studio is about uh, a very rapid way to get team members to um, get their ideas out uh, from their in their head. Because what happens in so many cases, and this is not just about the internal team. You do, I do design studio all the time with the customer, with the client, because so many times when they present an original business need that they have, in many cases they have this idea in their head of what they're envisioning the end product is going to be. And so what ends up happening is if what you then deliver to them doesn't match that, even though what you deliver may be a good idea, it wasn't what they had in their head, so therefore they don't like it. And so the purpose of this is to kind of, in the first step, the passive ideation is to get those things out and so that other people can kind of see what your ideas are. Everybody is basically, you take five minutes, everybody is kind of just sketching out as many ideas that they have in their head. It doesn't matter if it's, uh, it doesn't have to be pretty. It's all about, um, it's actually, the, the idea is for it to actually be very basic and just something you're doing very quickly. Um, and you can choose to have, some people choose to do many, draw many little pictures sort of on one page in terms of sort of as a little storyboard approach. In terms of it's just like you have one little screen and somebody click there and one little that page and that and, and so forth. Some people like to have like one page per screen and um, you know, first, it, it, the whole idea is that it, it a little bit of a story. And what some people do is they just have one screen with a lot of call outs to say, I wanted you know, that, that these kind of things happening. And actually, and we actually did a design studio with this aerospace architecture and these people who are way serious waterfall people. They're all about huge sophistication, highly regulated industry and whatever. And so what they did, they wrote this book like, she listed out some items like, well, I'd like to, she did kind of a page inventory of what she'd like to see on the page. And, you know, that worked for her. That the point is to get your ideas out in whatever way makes sense for you. Um, so I want to see, does everybody have some uh, paper to draw on here? Does anybody not have? Anybody, anybody not have markers? So what I'd like to do is for each pair, we're going to take five minutes to do passive ideation, meaning that you're not really going to be discussing or sharing ideas. This is about each individual getting their individual ideas out. Then in the next five minutes, we're going to be discussing your ideas and then iterating on that in the last five minutes. And then you have to divide it into five and three. Yes, that's right. One, one point. One point from Desiree to Rosette. So, right, so thanks for, for, for raising that. So let me just to be clear, and this is, I'm so glad you, you um, something that was just in, in obviously in my mind, but I didn't actually uh, actually say it, is that, so the reason we did all these cards the first time around is for that to be fodder and a foundation for your ideas. One is just to be thinking about this, but also use the cards that you created and to be thinking about, don't take those ideas and now imagine how would they actually look. So what that means is um, you don't need to, you can choose to focus on any one of these three. Maybe you have an idea that satisfies all three, but it's not, that is up to you in terms of which one of those ideas that you're gonna focus on. So does that make sense? Or that, are we okay? So let's do a five minute time box which starts now. Okay.
Okay, so that's uh, the first five minute time box. In the interest of time, I just want to keep going with the next iteration. In the next iteration, you know, those of you who have worked individually to now present and discuss your solutions uh, with your other person you're pairing with. For those of you who may be already paired on this in the first iteration, to iterate on that. Uh, and then after the next five minutes, then we're going to pairs are going to be presenting ideas um, to other pairs. So I uh, just want to introduce some time. We're just going to keep going, and uh, the next uh, five minutes. discussion with presentation. So we're going to do things a little bit differently because we only have about 15 minutes left. Uh, surprise, surprise. Then we'll still blow on and then we expect it, but that's okay. Um, so uh, how many people are familiar with Fishbowl? Okay, that's okay. If you're not, you will find out very soon what that is. Um, so rather than have pairs present to other pairs, what I thought we would do is have um, someone from the pair come up and present uh, to the group. But I'd like to combine that with a kind of a fishbowl presentation. It's a little bit of an experiment. We'll see if it works. So the way that fishbowl works is I have five chairs up here. Anybody can come up and sit down in four of the chairs. And the moment somebody sits down in the fifth chair, then one another person has to go and sit down. The purpose of that is to have sort of a, uh, be able to have a very, um, an agile, it's sort of an agile panel, as one, like one might think of it. And so does anybody, is anybody here who would like to come up and, uh, talk about their idea, or you can either talk about your idea, or you can talk about your experience. You don't have to actually talk about your idea. So does anybody have something that they would like to share? So come on and have a seat. Uh, and we, if anybody else would like to share something, you come down and you'll have a seat. So uh, we can we have four seats and... Um, and what I'd like to do is everybody else, because we've been sitting for so long, is like everybody else to come on up Let's stand up and let's so we can actually see uh, other people that are sitting here. Let's gather around. We've all been, sit we've all been sitting down. Um, and if there's any way that we, we can kill the projector, can we, is there someone who can turn the projector off? Um, can you make your slide black? I, I can. Hey, hey, hey. Oh. Hey. That will go back. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, who wants to go first? Who wants to talk about it? Yeah, run. Okay. One of the things that we found would be very helpful for encouraging people to donate would be to have, as part of the navigation that's available on every page, is to have a donate button or link. Also, something that will improve the confidence of people in donating is a, a button or a link that will lead to a third party page or to references to a third party page saying this is how we use donations in the past. Of the for every hundred dollars of donations that come in, five percent go to administrative, ninety-five percent go to to projects, and then a list of project uh, hierarchy of pages about the various projects. And the project would then have links to say this project would have a description, here's the project we've done, and then a link uh, Donate for this project, which would then lead them into the donation stream, but already saying specifically, donating to this particular project. How much do you want to donate? Okay. So I'm going to break a little bit of rules. So Fishbowl, one of the normal rules is that only people who are sitting at Fishbowl can talk. But uh, I'm going to break that rule a little bit here and say I want to see what people, if anybody has one or two reactions to this. You know, do you think this is sort of persuasive or not? Just really quick. Which card were you sold? I'm sorry? Which card were you salted? We were starting with this one, ideas pop in that from here. Sure, I like the idea to go to third party sites. That's good. Let's get someone else. Aside from you telling people about it, link to other people who will say good things to it. All right, so we had some cool ideas on the progressive impact, I think. Um, one of the things was showing a map where there would be little spots for the different 
villages that were affected, and so you could click on one and see what, what we had done there with the donations. And then having question marks for some of the other villages that we plan to expand to. And when you would click there, it says, but well, we need this much money before we're able to get there. So showing kind of where it started from and, and how it's, you know, how it's uh, spread throughout the area and where it can go next as, as long as we donate some. And then when you do make it to the donation page, you know, we we're trying to get you to donate more, obviously. So when you click on a different amount, it might show you the benefits that the people will get from that particular amount. So, you know, 10 bucks, you're, uh, you're helping patch a roof on a school, whereas with 100 bucks, you're helping them get solar panels on the school. So, Why solar panels with that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's showing, like, this is, by, by contributing, this is where we're going to be able to go. And then giving some visual feedback to the user of the explicit benefits that they'll get, and hopefully encouraging encouraging them. So, to do you or anybody else like to talk also about a little more? What was your experience of going through <coughs> these activities? Did you did you feel that you learned something new about UX and this relationship with development? Or well, I would. Any I would, one of you? Well, I've got a, yeah, I've got a meta. That's actually kind yeah. of my thing I came up to share, which was um, by simply doing kind of an iterative. Work separately, draw some stuff, and quick show and tell, and then go back and working individually, draw stuff again. There was this really cool, we started to converge very quickly on kind of a common theme, even though our ideas started out different. And the stuff that was coming up that was converging seemed a lot stronger than the individual stuff. And so the convergent, as opposed to like, hey, let's brainstorm and talk about and try to sit around a table talk about the idea. So like doing, showing, doing, showing. Convergence seemed to happen quicker in this. I thought it's stronger. Yeah. I'll, I'll second that. And so I'll speak on it. Sit down if you want to please talk about it. When we started, when we started drawing, when we started you know, pointing at uh, the possible compositions and how they would fit into the ideas, it seemed to speed up. Could you repeat that again after that? I was seconding uh, the, the, the notion of the person that's next to me who was saying that things speeded up when they were starting to iterate on visual examples. And that was our experience as well. That we were talking about how those would be matched up. Are you talking to someone else? Somebody else wants to? Oh, uh, just one of the um, uh, things that we were talking about is the reliability, the assurance of the, of the credibility of the site. So we were thinking of adding, like, um, using like the Facebook open graph. If you saw, if you came to the site, you immediately were seeing your other friends who had either were in, took an interest or had donated, that that would build some more credibility in that, as well as just like reviews from famous people um, who could also vouch for the credibility. Some credibility. And I just wanted to make some mention about the, kind of the processes that we went through here. In a real world scenario, um, we need to remember that this is this is a great exercise for, for understanding and learning, but um, through the iteration, there is validation that comes into place where you know you may iterate on a particular idea, but that iteration is based upon usually some sort of validation you've received on the uh, or feedback you've received on the design you put out there. So it's important to remember that it's not just iterate, you know, think about stuff and then iterate again. There is. Or there's a there's a section of time devoted to actually validating those ideas. In connection with the design or the with the requirement process that we kind of went through in the first exercise, I noticed that um, giving giving our our user um, scenarios, do you like this or do you like this? Is does this inspire confidence or not? Um, throwing out a few ideas, then started generating more um, or or sparked ideas in our users that he was able to communicate more ideas. Mm -hmm. And that, that customer challenge of figuring, well, I don't know what I can do with this technology. Um, by throwing out some examples, that sparks interest and, and ideas. Did you get ahead of you at any point? Did, he, did, he, did the ideas really start flowing to, to the point mm -hmm. of getting ahead of you? Or? Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen, I've, I've had that experience with all the Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a sort of a seat or a trick. Yes. And then the quality of the kiss. Does anybody else want to does anybody else want to share uh, either the concept or reflect on whether you this worked, does it not work? Uh, if this was useful or valuable, please come you can have a seat. There's a free spot there if somebody wants to challenge. Oh, yes. So so I think it's a really good point. I think you're touching on it is 
earlier I heard someone say, well, I have to build it first to get the feedback. You don't have to build it first. And I think you guys, a couple of you touched on it, that just in this, this exercise and iterating on the paper, you're testing it and you're finding out, is this going to work or not? So you don't have to wait for the code to find out if it's going to work or not and get the feedback. You get some great feedback with sketching with paper prototypes um, before you've actually invested a lot of time. You spent how much time on these? We spent five minutes, minute. and that's a lot less time kind of here for the investment in getting the sort of natural, beautiful user interface. You're going to get some good feedback. Yep. yep. Any other uh, reflections on this? Yes. yes. Go ahead. So, so, questions. Since this is an agile UX session, as in user experience, um, I'm not a UX guy, but I work with a lot of UX people. I think we came up with a lot of great ideas. But did we really touch on user experience? And if so, or if not, how do we apply these to user experience work then? Okay. So when you said did we really touch on user experience, uh, what if we were not touching user experience, what is it that we were touching on? Well, we came up with some great ideas, I think. But if they're implemented poorly from a user experience standpoint, did we really do good user experience work? Yes. So you raise a valid point that we only took this to a certain degree. We did, and I think what I uh, mentioned here earlier is, yes, there is a complete life cycle. The user experience does need to carry through that. And part of that was somewhat of a logistical issue that uh, this is more, you know, like I was saying earlier, the purpose of this, this, uh, this workshop was not so much for people to walk away to become a user experience designer, but more to have a sense of what aspects of user experience design, one, that they're complex, they're challenging, and that they have value. But certainly to your point, to truly have gone through those motions is to have continued where we left off here. And now the next step here is now we need to translate into something that we can actually build, right? And that's another very, very challenging step. Then we, when we build it, we need to actually deliver and present it to the user and have them tell us or, or show us by their actions, their behaviors, does this work, and then we iterate on them. So certainly there's more that we can do, but uh, yes, that's right. Carrie, just to follow up on your question, I think part of it is, I mean, Andrew's pre-digested some of this for you. For example, he put up some, you know, scenarios and stuff like that. If you're going to be doing this kind of exercise, you need to do it with your user experience people. Because if they're doing their job, they've done research, and they know that those, that those um, the capabilities that Anders is talking about are the right ones that you need to hit, for example, right? And they'll also be able to help you with UI sketching, which maybe some groups have more problems with than others, because that's their job. And, but what you are contributing to this is you know, your knowledge of that drive what you can't do, <laughs> or should do better another way, right? This is kind of a way that you're participating with your user yeah. experience. I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, Desiree, do you think you should be in the fishbowl? I was just wondering if we were still trying, yeah, to, we're trying, we're trying to keep with it. fishbowl. I don't want to be too militant about it, but if we have somebody just sat down in the fishbowl. All right. Yeah. Touch on what these two were saying. This is a very emotional process. Uh, we haven't um, seen anything that really drives home or uh, hits that uh, pressure point of the emotion of donating and, and uh, what can trigger someone to, to donate more. We, we come up with some concepts of how, uh, I don't know, one, one concept was an animated uh, portion that might, as the, increase, as the amount increases, it, it visually shows you and builds up a stockpile of food or, or uh, storyboarding uh, the individuals that you're helping, giving them a personality, uh, making them real to you, who you're helping and how the money you can help, uh, things like that. Well, we, were, we also came up with how do you take us for a team. 
I was compounding on his oh, idea since he's on reading. That's what you get here is when you change the rules. I know. Yeah. It's my bad. It's oh, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. He's doing a fishbowl butt. <laughs> 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 fishbowl butt. Take a frivolous idea. We came up with fast food. If you buy two McDonald's Happy Meals, you know, and spend 10 bucks, what can you, what can you do to help the charity out and yeah. show that example? So, yeah, so we, the fish bowl is somewhat broken down, but that's okay. Uh, I think we got, we got something out of that in terms of structure, uh, a little bit of reflection. Um, so I think we're about out of time. But uh, my hope is that this was something that was useful and valuable, and hopefully you uh, came through this session with learning something a little more than, than you did when you started. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you all so much for